This week on The Anxious Truth, we're talking about exercise and recovery, exercise and anxiety, interoceptive exposures, and sensitivity to all kinds of crazy bodily sensations that you do not like and fear. I have a special guest here, my friend Jenna Overbaugh is back, so let's go. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to The Anxious Truth. This is podcast episode number 229. We are recording in October of 2022. I am Drew Linsalata, creator and host of The Anxious Truth. This is the podcast that covers all things anxiety, anxiety disorders, and anxiety recovery. If you are new here and just stumbled in on YouTube or stumbled into the podcast, welcome. I hope you find this episode and all of my content helpful. If you are a returning listener or viewer, welcome back. Thank you for your continued support. Today, we are going to talk about anxiety, recovery, and exercise, physical sensations, what interoceptive exposures are, why we're afraid of our own bodies, what we can do about that, why exercise makes you feel worse instead of better, even though the whole internet tells you that it's supposed to make you feel better, and sort of how to manage that. So my friend Jenna Overbaugh is back. Jenna has not been on the podcast uh, for a while now. It's been at least a year and a half or so since she was on. Uh, Jenna is an anxiety and OCD specialist practicing in the Midwest of the United States. She's also affiliated with NoCD. Uh, and she knows her stuff. Uh, if you are following me on social media and follow along with my podcast, you should also be following along with Jenna. So if you go to the show notes for this episode at theanxioustruth.com slash 229, I will have all of her links or I'll put them in the description of the YouTube video if you're watching on YouTube. So before we get going, I will shorten this pitch because there's a lot to go over today. Uh, but just remember that The Anxious Truth is more than just this video and this podcast episode. There's a whole bunch of cool resources on my website at theanxioustruth.com, including a monthly webinar on distress tolerance that I do with Joanna Hardis. There are three books that I've written. There's 200 and somewhat other podcast episodes. There's all my social media stuff. There's a free like Anxiety 101 recovery training video on my YouTube that you can click on from my website. So go check it out at theanxioustruth.com. Uh, all the resources are right there on the homepage for the post part, most part. Go, go avail yourself of everything that I'm offering. Uh, and if you are enjoying my work, it's helping and you'd like to find a way to keep it ad and sponsorship free, all the ways to do that are at theanxioustruth.com slash support. And as always, I will tell you that it is appreciated, but never required. Thank, to all, thank you to all of you for any way that you support this work. I appreciate any and all of it. All right, let us get Jenna on. Uh, so we'll be back with Jenna on uh, camera and, and in studio. In studio means over restream, by the way. Uh, we're going to have a nice conversation. And I'll be back afterwards to wrap the whole thing up. All righty, then. Here we are, as promised. Next to me, I got it right, is Jenna Overbaugh, who has not been on the podcast for such a long time. Many of you know Jenna. Thank you much for coming on. I appreciate it. Thank you for having me. I love you, and I love being here. Oh, you're very welcome. So today we're going to talk about, like I mentioned in the intro, we're going to talk about exercise and, uh, oh, I have to put the fancy caption on the screen too. Wait, let me do that really quick because, you know, we're so professional. Ready? Boom, there it is. So if you want to go to the show notes, you can just go to that URL. Anyway, um, we're going to talk about exercise and anxiety and interceptive exposures and all the nasty, ugly feelings that you get when you're in the gym that you need but you don't want. So um, let's talk about that. Let's, uh, let's start with the idea of what interoceptive exposure really is. First of all, tell the people who you are because they know who you are, but just give it a quick like, Yeah, which is really weird. The last time I was here with you, I was in a corner in my – uh, old work office, hoping that the fire alarm didn't go off. I think I had like 200 followers on Instagram and I was just like, oh my gosh, this guy actually wants to talk to me. That's crazy. I think uh, might be yeah, here we are. Yeah. You're, you're <laughs> um, actually a larger following than I am now, I think possibly. I don't know about that. I try not to look, it freaks me out. But anyway, yes. Okay. So I'm Jenna Overbaugh. I'm, I'm a licensed professional counselor. I've been working with anxiety since 2008. Um, and yeah, I just knew from a very early age, I'm a, I always was a super anxious person myself, um, as a kid, but I also was always very competitive with my anxiety as well. So I always tried to go ahead first into it and, you know, see what I could do next to kind of overcome that. And eventually when I learned about exposure and response prevention, I was like, I have to do this. This is in my bones. I want to do this forever. Um, and so, yeah, it was just everything that I did from then on out worked in a residential OCD and anxiety recovery unit where I worked with the most debilitating cases of OCD and anxiety in the world, including a lot of people who needed interoceptives and had high levels of anxiety sensitivity, like we'll talk about. Um, I think everybody can probably benefit from some of those exercises, but yeah, it's just been a really rewarding experience. I love 
getting people to understand the benefit and doing difficult things and um, realizing eventually that there's a better way to live. What's better than that? So here I am. Well, thanks for coming. I appreciate it. Jenna is an outstanding psychoeducator. You're very good at teaching these things. So Thank you. I will have all of her links in the show notes. If you don't, by some miracle, you don't follow her, go do that. So anyway, let's, let's talk about interoceptives because a lot of people hear the word and they don't understand what it is. So let's talk about that first. So they understand sort of the background and what we're, what we're talking about. What's an interoceptive exposure? So an interoceptive is a fancy way of what I call kind of just a body exposure, right? So if anybody out there is, you know, at all familiar with the process of exposure work, it's the, this concept that we do something to kind of push you outside of your comfort zone. We're going in the direction of something that makes you anxious. We're doing something that you've been scared of or avoiding. Um, and usually those exposures are things kind of outside or for triggers rather outside of your body. Um, so if you're fearful of car crashes, then we'll gradually work with you on that kind of stimuli, right? Looking at images of car accidents or trying to drive independently without those safety behaviors. If you're worried about contamination, obviously we'll work with you on those related kind of concepts and exposures. But a lot of times these things that we're fearful of are not happening outside of our body. Sometimes we're afraid of our own physiological sensations. Um, and so these physiological sensations are normal. The physiological sensations are not the problem. It is our body's natural reaction to send us into that fight, flight, or freeze mode whenever we do interpret threat. Um, so then we start to experience that adrenaline rush, the nausea, the, if you're anything like me, hives on your chest. Like I always get like red blotches on my chest. Um, just that, that these feelings of tingliness and not just not feeling good, just the, the physiological feeling of ick, you can get dizzy, um, shortness of breath, rapid breathing. And so it's when people start to be sensitive to those sensations mm -hmm. that creates more anxiety. Oh my gosh, I'm, I'm getting nauseous. What does that mean? Oh my gosh, what if I get sick and I'm here and I can't tolerate that? Oh my gosh, I'm dizzy. I can't, I can't focus. What if I fall over? What if, what if, and then they start to be anxious about being anxious. They start to have fear of fear. They mm -hmm. start to panic about these sensations. And so what happens after that, but more of these physiological sensations, and that's kind of how they can kind of compound themselves into having an anxiety or a panic attack. Yeah. Um, and so these interoceptives are really critical because you know, we can do these external exposures in their everyday life, like going to the grocery store or doing these things that they avoid in their life, but we have to get them to become habituated to and comfortable with and okay with the physiological sensations that they're fearful of. And so yeah. interoceptives would be things like uh, breathing through a straw for a certain amount of time, uh, running place for a certain amount of time, holding your breath, um, shaking your, your head back and forth. Yeah, spinning in a chair, anything to intentionally elicit these uncomfortable sensations in a way that's challenging but manageable. And they work via the same principles as traditional exposure work that other people um, might be familiar with already. Yeah. I have to plug in my laptop, BRB. Yeah. Go right ahead. So while Jenna is plugging in her laptop, I will add to that if you've ever heard me say that the driving is not the exposure, the supermarket is not the exposure. It's just what we use to trigger the fear. Yes. This is what we're talking about. Uh, you're not worried about the supermarket or the driving or the staying home loan. You worry about how you feel when you do those things. And so interoceptors are a way to just skip the supermarket and get right to the bodily sensations that you hate. Mm -hmm. So, so many people, when I mention interoceptive exposures, they, you know, they sort of blanch at it. Like that is insane. Are you telling me I'm literally supposed to intentionally make my heart race? The answer yes. is yes. Yeah, we kind of are. So, yeah. <laughs> and I, mean, I know it's, a, it's paradoxical, right? But all of it is. Um, and the idea is you're probably never going to love this sensation. Like, I don't know anybody who's going to love being dizzy or somebody who's going to love being short of breath or somebody who's going to love being nauseous. That's not the point. The point isn't that you have to like it. The point is just that you can tolerate that sensation in such a way that it's not going to dictate your ability to engage with your values, right? Like that you can tolerate a little bit of a headache and still go to work, that you can tolerate a little bit of nausea or hives and not go into this cascade of subsequent compulsions and safety behaviors that, that we know just exacerbate everything and make it worse. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it really lends itself to one, you learn to habituate to it. So you simply just get used to it. 
-hmm. over time, right? And then you also learn that one, these sensations are not as catastrophic as I think they are, that losing, you know, you know, mm -hmm. dizziness does not equal death, <laughs> uh, losing my breath temporarily does not equal that it's going to last forever. You also learn through this experience of doing it repetitively and in a prolonged fashion um, that your fears are not as likely to happen as you thought they were so that you're, you know, I'm dizzy, but that doesn't necessarily mean that I fall to the ground in the middle of Target and no one is there to help me and I just die alone forever. Yeah. Um, and it also, my favorite thing that it teaches you is that you can handle it, right? Like that's that if important. these things happen, you can handle it. And yeah. I think that's like the biggest takeaway from all of this work is that people need to learn that they can handle it. A hundred percent. I think that is the, in my eyes, that's the biggest lesson for sure. Not that you are guaranteed that nothing unpleasant will happen, but that even if it does, you'll, you'll handle it. It's so you won't like it. I love the part when you said you're never going to like, like them. And a lot of people get confused when they hear the word acceptance that like, well, accepting doesn't mean liking, it means tolerating, it means right. navigating, you're right. So really important. So and when we talk about intentionally bringing up those sensations, those bodily sensations by running in place or jumping up and down or spinning around in your desk chair or whatever it happens to be, those are interoceptives, but exercise, which is what we wanted mm -hmm. to talk about today, because so many people struggle because they're told constantly, like general mental health advice on the internet will say, oh, if you're really anxious, you got to burn off that adrenaline and exercise and it's good for your mental health, except sometimes it makes them feel worse. Because mm -hmm. when you exercise, you feel all those things that you are afraid to feel. Mm -hmm. So I found in my own personal recovery, I knew already what interoceptive exposures were. But when I got back to the gym and started lifting again, like heavy, when I was in the middle of my recovery, I kind of forgot that I would that's what I would be doing. And those were some really difficult forget that the weight was really heavy at the time because I was out of shape. But uh, <laughs> They were some really difficult first couple of weeks there. And I had quite a few like panic attacks and near panic attacks sitting on a bench or in a squat rack. Mm -hmm. It was not fun, but it did teach me how to really get used to those sensations in a big yeah. way. Yeah. And, and while you're continuing to put yourself in those situations, which you hung in there and you stuck with it, whether yeah. you're conscious of it or not, your brain is collecting information, right? Like, huh. I uh, Drew's coming to the gym yet again, and he's experiencing these things yet again, yet the world continues to spin and he continues to have these panic attacks yet here we are. Um, yeah. so, you know, even though it feels like, oh my gosh, I'm here and I keep coming to the gym and I still feel so anxious, you're doing really great work. It's going to take time for your brain to learn mm -hmm. new things. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, it, it just seems like you continue to give yourself that those experiences and our brains learn through experience. Our brains cannot learn through logic or rationalization or, oh, your doctor said that you were fine and okay to exercise. So everything's good because anxiety yeah. is just going to come back with one more. Well, well, what if, right? Like what if that this doctor right. what he was talking about, right? Um, another great example of this is, um, about two, two and a half years ago, I randomly, I think you know about this too. I had a random seizure. Um, mm -hmm. I and remember. I it, like, I have no family history of seizures. They, they did an EKG an EEG CAT scans, MRI, like everything that you could possibly imagine. And they had no explanation as to why I had a seizure, um, which in a way was really relieving because I'm so glad that nothing was wrong, but also was very anxiety provoking because I was like, what the heck is wrong? I don't know how to prevent this again. Um, mm -hmm. And I am a very active person. I work out and run five, six days a week. Um, so it was very scary. It was like, I don't know what initiated it. Um, anytime I got short of breath and dizziness in particular was really, really challenging for me. And for the first couple of days after the, you know, when I would go to the gym, I was like, I, I, I don't know whether I should go to the bathroom so I don't have a seizure in front of everybody or if I should go tell the front desk. So in case I do have a seizure, they can call the police or like call the ambulance, right? And thank goodness I never made a decision one way or the other. And I just kept working out because it's been three years now and I get dizzy all the time. <laughs> I get dizzy all the time. Yeah. And I have never had a, a seizure working out. Now I did have another seizure completely unrelated a year after just complete. It was in the middle of the night. Um, still no reason for it. But you know, what was interesting was I remember being in the hospital for the second time. And I remember thinking, you know, like, this is probably going to happen again, like whether it's in a year or in a couple of weeks or five years from now, 10 years from now. And I wasn't even as anxious about it because mm -hmm. I was like, you know what, like I already have done this twice. Like 
if it happens, then it happens. Like I, I, I can't, I'm doing everything that I can within reason, listening to my doctor, not anything above and beyond that. Yeah. I'm still engaging in my values to the best of my ability. I'm not going to let it dictate my life. Like if it happens again, then it happens again. And I will deal with it when it happens the same way that I've dealt with it the first two times. So I really feel like so much of it comes back to exactly what you said, which is these exposures aren't about proving to yourself that your worst fear doesn't happen. It's about proving to yourself that you can handle it. Yeah. Even when you're afraid, you know, it doesn't matter. We used to think that like, well, you, you habituate to it and the anxiety goes down and you're okay as long as the anxiety goes down. But really what we're learning now is like, well, even if it doesn't, even if you're anxious the whole time at the gym, you're still okay. Totally. Yeah. When you can accept that lesson, like, well, as long as it goes away after 10 minutes, I'm okay. Because I know a lot of people do that. They'll go to the gym and like, okay, I just got to get through 10 minutes and 12 or 15 minutes later, they're still feeling anxious. So they bail. Mm -hmm. Like I'm only okay if the level of my anxiety drops. And really the lesson is no matter what your level of anxiety is in that context, you're okay. Yeah. You can, you can, you can tolerate that. And no matter what we're doing, you know, yeah. we are, con our brains are constantly picking up what we're throwing out. And so mm -hmm. if we, you know, start a timer at 12 minutes and we say, okay, I can't do this anymore. You know, I'm out and you leave the gym while you're anxious as a way to reduce your anxiety in the gym, your brain, whether you're conscientious of it or not, is going to get the message that, huh, leaving or being in the gym must be dangerous. Yeah. Leaving the gym makes Jenna better. feel better. Therefore, in the future, we should be even more afraid of the gym. We should make Jenna or Drew feel even more of those things so that they leave that dangerous situation later. I think yeah. we get so caught up in like just wanting those uncomfortable feelings and those physiological sensations to go away that we forget you are giving your brain a message for the next time that you go to the gym or the next time that you feel this thing, like whatever you do now is going to dictate, you know, whether next time is either easier or harder. That's true. I, even, but marginally easier. When we say easier, a lot of people misconstrue that. Like, oh, I did it once. It should be easy now. No, easier. And that's all relative. It comes in tiny little increments. And I think the other thing that's important in that scenario is when you bail on the exercise, you leave the gym or whatever, you get off your treadmill, you go sit down. That sensation is always going to end. It ends no matter what happens. It's always going to end. Like your body, even in a full-blown panic, it's going to get exhausted and the panic will end at some right. point. And then you, not only did you teach yourself that the gym is a place you should not ever go, but you somehow taught yourself that leaving the gym is what saved you because it ended when I left. So that's, there's two bad lessons going on there. That, yeah, that fight, things. flight, or freeze is initiated automatically when our brains interpret threat, whether that's a real threat or not, whether right. that's an actual heart attack or just a racing of your heart. Mm -hmm. um, but those systems stay on because of how we continue behaviorally, right? So if we are continuing to think, oh my gosh, why am I so dizzy? I have to go on Google. I, oh my gosh, I have to stay perfectly still because I can't handle this dizziness. Oh my gosh, you're asking your partner why you're so dizzy and you're trying to do all these tests for yourself to not get dizzy, right? Yeah. Or you're like intentionally trying to slow down your breathing or quicken up your, like when you, as long as you are acting as though you are in a threatening situation, Mm -hmm. Your brain is going to interpret your behavior as though you are in a stressful situation and it's going to continue to keep on those systems. So gotcha. while those systems come on automatically, it's your interpretation of and your reaction to those sensations that either tell eventually the system that it's okay, I don't really actually need your help here right now, or mm -hmm. yes, stay on, stay on, stay on. And so often we're doing that to ourselves. Yeah, which is really sucks. So if we bring that back, and paradoxically, again, the more you try to turn it off, the less likely it is to turn off. So that's always really yeah. difficult. But we bring it back to the whole idea of exercise in the context of recovery and getting better. When people say, well, it makes me feel worse, it's important that we frame that and say, no, 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 it makes you feel. Mm -hmm. it, just stop there. Forget the worst part. It makes you feel the things you don't like. So and, and of course, anytime that you're no longer living in this like obsessive and anxious bubble of protection and safety, mm -hmm of course, it's going to be a little bit more difficult because you're not avoiding things, right? Yeah. So yeah. that's something that always like strikes me as interesting with people when they start to do these anxiety provoking things. It's like, I just, I feel worse. And it's like, of course you do, because you weren't, you were just avoiding before, but like, yeah. is that lifestyle also sustainable, right? Like, or sometimes if you bring it back to even to today's topic, 
I started going to the gym. I'm doing my interoceptives. I'm doing other exposures. And now I'm having panic attacks even in my house. Like, yeah, well, you trying to drop the illusion that your house is safe. Like when you mm -hmm. stop pretending that you're safer in one place than the other or doing one thing, there's no safe zone. Like yeah. it, it sucks, but that's a very, so this is something you, I'm guessing, see pretty commonly in your practice too. Like oh, I feel worse. Absolutely. Okay, you're making yeah. me do these things. Now I feel worse everywhere and I don't have no more safe zone anymore. Yeah, mm -hmm. that happens sometimes. So I get that. Yeah. So what, what does somebody do? So, so you decide, okay, I hear that exercise is good for me, but it makes me feel worse. Oh, but Drew and Jenna are saying, we, that's, this is why it's just eliciting. It makes me feel like I'm anxious. It's the things I hate. So what would you tell somebody to do when they decide I want to exercise? I miss it. I used to be an athlete, whatever it is, but it makes my anxiety worse. What would you tell a client that, that comes in with that complaint? I would, I'm really big on, as you probably know, psychoeducation. Um, mm -hmm. I want people to understand why I'm having them do the things that they do. I don't want them to just do it because Jenna said so. I want them to really understand and absorb it and make it their own. I want them, before they do anything, I need them to understand why, when it comes to OCD and anxiety, why it's so important for them to want what they don't want why it's so necessary for us to be pushing you outside of your comfort zone and why hating these symptoms is actually making them worse um, and why we're going to do something different instead. Um, right. We'll talk about values. We'll talk about all that stuff. And then, you know, once they're kind of on board with that whole general process um, and, you know, they evaluate that, yes, exercise is within my values. I no longer want anxiety to be running the show. You know, we'll do some interoceptives together. So um, first things first, and this is readily available online. Anybody can find it. It's called the Anxiety Sensitivity Index or the mm -hmm. AFI. Um, and it's just a questionnaire that basically will identify, you know, are, do you have something called anxiety sensitivity? So anxiety sensitivity is exactly what it is that we're talking about, where you are sensitive to the physiological symptoms of anxiety. You know, I don't like it when I feel nauseous. I don't like other people seeing me nervous. Um, you know, I get freaked out when I start to notice myself sweating in a group of people. What, you know, a bunch of questions. Um, and it'll probably give you a pretty good idea of, yep, I am one of those people. I'm definitely going to benefit from these interoceptives or these body exposures. Yeah. Um and so some, you know, everyone feels something different, right? So I get really nervous when I am dizzy. I get really nervous um, and anxious when I start to feel nauseous because I feel like that coincided with how I felt when I had my seizures. Um, sure. I don't really get nervous about being short of breath. I don't get nervous like when I'm rapidly breathing, probably because I'm a runner. And you it's know, like a part-time job to be short of breath at this point. Right, exactly. <laughs> and so, but also like really goes with what we're saying, right? Like the more that you are doing something, the less anxiety provoking it is, right? So um so, but that could be the opposite for somebody else, right? Like I know my son, for instance, he loves being dizzy. He loves when I like spin him around and he does yeah. those playground things. I was going to um, mention that when we're kids, we do kind of love that. Yeah. Kids love to spin around. Exactly. And, and a lot of us like feeling these things when we're in control of it, right? Yeah. So that's an aspect of it too, right? Like some people might really love like having a couple drinks and feeling a little bit dizzy, right? But they're in control of that because, and they know why they're a little bit dizzy under that situation because they did that. That's self-induced versus it just happening randomly. So that's a really yep. important piece as well. Um, but yeah, so I would evaluate with the person. You know, what are the symptoms that they particularly hate? What do they not like feeling? Um, what are some symptoms that they would try to avoid if they could? And then we'll identify some interoceptive exposures that, that we would do to try to elicit that. So, um, yeah. you know, if someone is really triggered by feelings of nausea, you know, maybe we would have them, you know, you know, spin around in a chair. Maybe that would make them nauseous. Um, if somebody is really triggered by, um, like muscle fatigue. I've had people like do planks before. Um, I've yeah. had people do like a bunch of push-ups before and then like sit with that feeling of like tingliness in their muscles. Um, so there's lots of room to be creative, but obviously, right? Like we also want this to just be implemented as a lifestyle. So to do these, ex to do these interoceptive exposures under the guidance or like structure on your own, of a, you know, with the therapist or on your own, that's all great. Um, yeah. 
but you know, going to the gym, right? Like I would identify with the person, like what are some small, challenging, but manageable ways we can get you to do that? You know, um, maybe arm day would be easier the, for the person than leg day, right? Um, maybe there are certain exercises even within an arm day that would be easier for the person than other exercises for an arm sure. day. Um, yeah. Maybe there are different cardio machines that might be a little bit more manageable for the person. So lots of ways. Incremental there. Like, yeah. So the answer, like, well, what do I do if I go to the gym and I panic and I don't like it? How do I, how do I do that? The bad news that Jen is giving you is, well, we do more of that. Yes. But you can identify that and say, well, I don't, I, I get so scared. My heart is racing. Okay. Well, it's good that you're going to the gym. You're going to have to keep doing that, but maybe start a little more slowly. One of the most popular two podcast episodes I ever did were about this topic years ago. And I thought if you have to start by just standing in front of your sofa and walking in place, because that little bit of heart rate elevation sends you into a panic, that's a perfectly acceptable way totally. to start. You don't have oh. to go to the gym and do two hours on a stair climber. You can literally just walk gently on a treadmill. If that makes you uncomfortable. Yeah, you're going winning. up and down your stairs. Yeah, yeah, you win. Like anytime you're uncomfortable, you win. So it, in that situation, it's okay to be incremental. I want to go back yeah. for a second to uh, a thing that you said about psychoeducation and making sure that your client understands why they have to do this stuff. And I think in the context of, of exposure, that's super important as it is doing scary stuff in the context of physicality and exercise, I think, especially for dudes, I'm going to talk for the men in the, in the audience here, since I'm one of them, it's really easy to get caught up in the idea that the message is just do it, mm -hmm. feel the fear and do it anyway. Like there's no nuance in that message at all. And that I think is a damaging message to a certain extent. Yeah. You can maybe boil it down to that in the end. That's what it looks like operationally, but there's so much more to it than that. And we're also never doing these things to be hardcore. These are not character building exercises. This has nothing to do with lifting a log over your head with a bunch of other people at a retreat weekend. Those might be fun activities one day, but you're learning. This is a learning and cognitive thing. So being connected to why you are doing this is really important or it could start to get mm -hmm. frustrating and, and, and disheartening for people. Yeah. And the response yeah. prevention too, I think is super important yeah. right like i think the exposure piece like that's what people visualize when they see what it is that we're talking about right that's what they envision like walking on a treadmill going up and down their um stairs using the lawnmower the you know walking yeah. lawnmower versus having your partner do it or something like that going to the gym whatever you know i think we also sometimes forget that we have to do some response prevention too right like it's the most important be, part you can't just like go hard in the gym and like have have the best workout ever and go super hard on the treadmill because it's a great exposure for you and you're just going to do the feel the fear and do it anyway but then you're like constantly checking your apple watch to make sure that your heart rate isn't going crazy right. um right. you can't like go crazy go hard in the gym and then go home and you know google for the next hour about all the symptoms that you're feeling it's Went really to the gym, important came home to xanax one of the few times i ever caved and took a benzo was after a workout hard workout i believe that bad idea Mm -hmm. That was not a good it's lesson. So reinforcing. Yes, it completely is. So the RP is the most important part of the the, the thing, or totally. else. But yeah, people yeah. will say that, like, "Oh yeah, I could do that in the gym." Like, okay, I'm gonna go to the. I'm Drew and Jenna told me I'm gonna go to the gym tomorrow, and I'm gonna go hard. And it's like, it's it has to be challenging and manageable in terms of you also being able to resist your rituals. So I would yeah. rather somebody like walk on the treadmill at their house without any safety behaviors of checking their checking their watch checking mm -hmm. their you know heart rate on their throat or their wrist or whatever um no googling anything like just truly allowing themselves to feel the anxiety and not having to do anything about it mm -hmm. than to go hard in the gym and then do all these rituals because all yeah. those safety behaviors that you do either before during or after it totally negates the experience and it negates the learning that we're talking about um, you don't yep. learn that you can handle it. You learn, I can handle it as long as my Apple watch says that I'm okay. And right. then, you know, you don't have your Apple watch or your Apple watch glitches, or you continue to have to look at it. And it's like, you're still spinning your wheels because you never actually learned that you could tolerate it. Yeah, that it was okay. And in a way, when you do it that way and you continue to engage in conditional okayness, I'm okay as long as I'm drinking my water. And as you should drink your water in the gym, of course, but Sometimes people do that compulsively and as a safety ritual, as long as I'm always drinking, as long as I can always see the, the automatic defibrillator. Like that yeah. was me. Like, as long as I could see it there and I know somebody's close to it, I'll be all right. Like, I had to stop doing that. Like, all right, I'm just going to, I know where it is. It didn't move. It's fine. Stop that. 
But if you don't, if you continue to engage in those things while you're doing this hard work in the gym or in any other place, it can start to become a bit of a pointless torture merry ground. And that's where people say, I don't know, I'm doing all the things here. I'm going to the gym, I'm going hard, but I'm not getting any better. I'm doing something wrong. Well, you're placing all kinds of conditions on doing those hard things. So that's a difficult. And so thing. sneaky, right? Looking at your watch. Very. Very. Uh, Very. Yeah. Just making a glance over to make sure that the, you know, where the AD yeah. Really yeah, the AD really thing, thing is. Right? Right? Yeah. It's so sneaky. Very, very, very sneaky. And those are habits that take a, by the way, they take a long time to break. So you can't just decide one day, that's it. I'm doing none of, Jenna said no more safety behaviors. You need to just drop them all instantly. It will not work that way. Sometimes it takes a while to even ferret out what the hell they are. That thing where I would keep track of the defibrillating device and to the point where I was actually a little bit more afraid because the lat pull down was the furthest away from that. And in my brain, you know, seconds count, of course. You gotta <laughs> so, do the lat pull downs. You, you gotta do it, you can't, right. Down. You cannot do, you know, that. And uh, all right, it's a bro exercise, but it is what it is, all right? Hey, I'm gonna pull from- Wait, I do lat, I do lat pull downs. Thank you. Well, pull from above, pull from the floor, pull from in front. That's a that's a good back workout. So anyway, in the end, I think that the bottom line here is yes, exercise might make you feel worse, but it is good for you on so many levels. Mm -hmm. But you may have to get past just the mechanics of I'm afraid of my heartbeat, which you can use these interoceptives, you can go incrementally, you can remember why you're doing it, you can start to drop your safety and, and escape behaviors. And then at some point, you get to the point where yes, now you can begin to realize those other benefits that you read about in self magazine, mental health, stress relief. Initially, that exercise is probably more stressful than a stress reliever in the beginning. And that's okay. It's oh, yeah. Be. And everyone's different, right? Like there's nothing, especially when we're talking about people, especially when we're talking about bodies, especially when we're talking about mental health. And here we're talking about all those things. There's nothing that like fits everybody, right? It's like, exercise is an anxiety reliever for every single person ever, regardless of the nuance, right? Like you have to be, oh. everyone's different, right? So oh. if, if that's the case, I think it can be helpful, but it can also, you know, depending on someone's anxiety and triggers, of course it can be anxiety provoking. And that's also really addressable. It's also really treatable. Correct. Yeah. And I think we, you know, as we sort of wrap it up, cause we're about the half hour mark, with an OCD specialist on the screen, we got to mention this, that sometimes the exercise can become compulsive. Totally. So I, I absolutely know people. I know one particular person, he's doing much better now. He's done a lot of really great work, but this person a couple of years ago was sure that he found the answer. And that was when I start to feel really anxious, I just do push-ups because mm -hmm. I burn off my adrenaline and that makes me feel better. And he literally found himself, found himself at concerts in arenas. He got into a fight at one point because he tried to drop and do push-ups in a crowded concert. And you can't do that. It became a ritual that he must do to feel better. That can happen. So yeah, people totally. will get up in the middle of the night and go walk. I have to go walk or I go for a run at three o'clock in the morning if I panic at night. Mm -hmm. Kid, don't use it. Or like, I, I think just like general perfectionism and rigidity in their routines, right? Like I have mm -hmm. to do it this way. Like I have to do this workout or else. Yes. Right? Like, or else something bad will happen. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I feel like we all, it can come in so many different forms. It can come in, it can manifest in so many different sneaky ways for every single person, depending on their unique fears. But, you know, I feel like we all kind of feel that feeling, right? Like I feel it in my chest. Like when I'm doing something that's very guided by fear and mm -hmm. I'm feeling compelled to do something that I don't want to do and that I don't really feel good about, even if I haven't like put all the specifics on it, I can feel it. I can feel that like something's not right. Like I'm, I'm going to this workout, even though I know I probably shouldn't go. Um, I know that I'm doing this behavior, even though I know I probably shouldn't like, so be gentle with yourselves. Like there are still things that I do, um, that, you know, are probably in favor of fear versus in favor of my values. Like it's definitely not a perfect process. Um, mm -hmm. but yeah, be gentle with yourselves. It's very nuanced and you'll, you know, with more and more education too, I think you'll notice like, oh that's another sneaky thing that I do, right? Like I always have to have 128 ounces of water or else. Like yeah. usually when there's like a sense of urgency there or it's followed by a or else. Or else. Yeah, In order so to good. is another phrase yeah. so that I feel, you know, those are really important phrases. So good conversation. I mean, we can't cover every last, you know, I know there's a lot of people listening that are going to say, yeah, but you didn't tell me exactly what to do, but we kind of did. We just didn't give you specific steps. Look you know. up the anxiety sensitivity index. I think it's yeah. available for everybody. You'll be like, oh my gosh, checking off all the boxes probably. Yep. 
identify what your specific physiological triggers are, whether that's dizziness, nausea, could be a bunch of things. Yeah. And start with what it is that you're avoiding. I think we like overcomplicate this like exposure work sometimes. I think sometimes, yep. you know, I get the most common question that I get is like, what exposure should I do for this? Or what exposure should I do for that? And it's like, start with what you're avoiding, right? Yeah. Like I'll write a list of all the things that you're avoiding, write a list of all the things that you would love to be able to do if anxiety and these symptoms weren't on the table and identify small challenging but still manageable things you can do with response prevention mm -hmm. that you can do make them yeah. into small manageable steps and do it and commit to it and then reach out to me and drew and say that you did that thing and hell we'll yeah we love that we'll <laughs> totally share for you jen is great at that for sure i can tell you for sure uh, and i the only thing i would add to that is as you're making that list of all the things you're afraid and all the things you're avoiding, think about that. Why do I avoid it? Is it because I'm afraid of driving or is it because I'm afraid when my heart starts to pound? Well, if it's because your heart, well, you have you have legs and arms and you can make your heart beat faster. So you can start that process small with little baby steps if you have to, to get the ball rolling. That's better than no steps. And you could even start just in your house. You can do these things today if you really needed to. Mm -hmm. So and there's into it. I know that's like a totally oh, yeah. like even more paradoxical thing yep. in intervention, but Yep. You know, I, I think what, especially when we have these physiological symptoms and we're up against our own bodies, it's very easy to be on the defense. Like, oh my yeah. gosh, why do I feel that way? Why do I feel that way? I don't want to feel that way. Get away from me. I just want this feeling to stop. Yeah. Our mindset sh shifts as soon as we go on the offense, as soon as we can say like, you know what, anxiety, bring it on. Yeah. You know, I'm recognizing my heartbeat racing, bring it on, throw it up a notch. You know, if I have to take what you're serving, give me, give me two servings. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's not going to feel genuine. It's not going to feel good. It's not going to feel easy and it's not supposed to, yeah. but as you continue to make this part of your regular routine and you do it more often, again, you're giving your brain those messages for next time. You're giving your brain that experience for next time. Hey, Jenna's like asking for me to make her even more dizzy. What the heck? How could this be? Yeah. She must not be anxious about this anymore. I guess it's okay to let down my guard now. Yeah. It's yeah. Time. Love how you said it won't feel genuine. You're you're genuinely faking it at first. You're pretending. Oh, totally. It's totally fine it's though. Really, truly a fake it till you make it type yeah, of thing. Yeah. The lead with the behavior and your belief will come after. That's just the way it has to go. Mm -hmm. So thank you so much. You know, so this is the third or fourth time Jen has been on the podcast. It has you haven't been on in a while, but if you go to the anxious truth.com slash two two nine, that's the show notes for this episode. I will link the other episodes. We did one on orthorexia and that compulsive eating, and I have to eat the proper things and compulsive exercise. And then we did one on postpartum uh, OCD, if I remember correctly. We did. Really good. Really mm -hmm. good. So Jen has been on before. She'll be on again, as if I have my way. I will wrangle you into it. And I won't be late this time, next time. Promise. Thank you. So thanks so much. I appreciate it. I will have all the ways to get to Jenna. Well, how can people get to you now? Because they might not go to the show notes. Yeah. So speaking of Instagram, yeah, you can find me on Instagram at Jenna.Overbaugh. And I also have my own podcast, which I'm just realizing I don't think you were ever on. All the hard things. You have what? That's the best name of a podcast in the whole. So exactly. It is inspired Sorry. because one of the people that I used to work with and doing all this work, and I feel like this will be relevant for your audience too, is she would ask me like, if I could choose to have something be easy why would I intentionally do the hard thing? And it was like one of those moments that I'll never forget because I had so many things to say, but I also had nothing to say. Yeah. And I like really thought about that for a very long time. It's like three years later and I'm still thinking about it. Mm -hmm. This concept that like doing hard things is good for you, right? Like, yeah, it, it's, in good. General. it's how you learn. It's how we grow in the gym, right? It's how we grow mm -hmm. mentally. It's how we build character. It's how we learn that we can, get to the next level. It's how we, you know, step outside of our comfort zones. It's how we stake claim on our own brains and, you know, let this life be ours and not dictated by anxiety. So yes, it's called all the hard things for that reason, because yeah, I want to empower people to do all the hard things. It's important to do hard things. It's good to do hard things. You could just search anywhere that you can listen to podcasts, search for all the hard things or search for Jenna Overbar. You'll find and it. If you don't find me, you'll find Glennon Doyle because she also has one oh, called. She has one called Hard. We can do hard things. We can things. do hard things, but I have my name first, Yamit. Yeah, go to the source. Go right to Jenna. Forget Glennon Doyle. So uh, anyway, but if you go to my, my uh, website, I'll have all Jenna's links and everything, which would be great. Thank you so much for coming on, my friend. I appreciate Thank it. Thank you. Awesome. Bye. All right, I'll be back to wrap it up in a few seconds. Hang in there, guys. All righty. We are back in the studio. And by the studio, I mean the very same place that I have been for the last 30 minutes with Jenna. It's just that me on the screen alone this time. She's not next to me. 
Uh, how awesome is Jenna? Jenna is the best. I'll give you a little behind the scenes from today. I was late to record this podcast because I messed up on my calendar and Jenna was gracious enough to accommodate that. And I'll tell you another little inside thing that I, I think she wouldn't mind me telling you. Uh, when I decided that I wanted to go back to graduate school and get my master's degree and become a licensed therapist, Jenna was one of the therapists who was nice enough to write me a lovely letter of recommendation to help me get into my grad program. So thank you, Jenna. I will always be eternally grateful for her to her for that help. Uh, I will make sure to get Jenna back on the podcast on a reasonably regular basis. She's busy, I'm busy, but we'll make it work because every time she comes, there's really good stuff to be had. And if you guys do not know Jenna and you want to follow her, like we said at the end of the recording, go to theanxioustruth.com slash 229. I will have all of her links. Uh, or if you're watching on YouTube, just check the video description. I'll put all of her links there. Go check her out. She's awesome. That is episode 229 of the Anxious Truth podcast in the can. I hope it has been useful to you and you've learned something, something that you can use. Come back for more. You know it's over because music. That is, as always, Afterglow by Ben Drake. It's the song that you hear at the beginning and end of every episode of The Anxious Truth. Ben has been gracious enough to let me use it for several years now. I dig it. You can find more about Ben and his music at his website at bendrakemusic.com. I almost forgot that. And uh, I'm going to ask you a favor, as I always do, if you're listening to this podcast on Apple Podcasts or Spotify or any platform that lets you rate or review the podcast, leave a five-star rating. Maybe take a second and write a review because it helps other people find the podcast and we can help as many people as we possibly can. I appreciate that. It helps me out. If you're watching the video on YouTube, then subscribe to the channel. Hit the notification bell so that you know when I upload new videos. Like the video. Leave a comment. Sometimes it takes me a while to circle back to my YouTube comments, but I always will. I promise I dig you guys over on YouTube. And that's it. We're done. I will be back next week to record another podcast episode. I do not know what I'm going to be talking about, but I will be here. And remember, as always, this is the way. It's all around you. You can breathe it in. And this is where your story begins. You got the feeling that you're going to win. Yeah, you're doing fine. No looking back, but sweating on the path. You know you'll never.